he knows he'll be judged on what those projects are actually doing by 2030 in the same way that his homelessness, he will be judged on the figures in terms of homelessness in a year's time and Mm. five years' time. So I think his ambition would be, as it is with all his work, for it to be sustainable, not necessarily saving the world one man at a time. When I look at the climate crisis, I actually see a leadership crisis. But when I look at Prince William, on the other hand, he is a leader that is part of this generational shift towards repairing our planet. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A Right Royal Podcast with me, Andrea. And me, Emmy. In this week's episode, we're looking at the Earthshot Prize, a huge, ambitious 10-year, £50 million project which aims to find solutions to some of the Earth's biggest environmental issues, led by the Prince of Wales. It launched in 2021, and it's a passion project for William and sees him following in the footsteps of his father, King Charles, and his grandfather, the Duke of Edinburgh, in championing ways to save the planet. Indeed. And as usual, we have some amazing guests to help us understand what William and his Earthshot Prize are hoping to achieve. We have Sunday Times Royal Editor and Broadcaster Roya Nika joining us, who has been breaking stories on the Royal Family for many years and has attended the two Earthshot Prize ceremonies and was the first journalist to interview William as Prince of Wales. Plus, Hello's very own US editor Justin Ravitz will give us the lowdown about the Earthshot Innovation Summit, which he attended in New York this September. And we'll be talking to an actual Earthshot winner, Vitaire Cowan. But first, we can't kick off the show without having our environmentally friendly royal editor, <laughs> <laughs> Emily Nashin, for a chat. Hi, Emily. Hello. Hi. You're recycling me, right? Are you environmentally we friendly? We recycle you every You're, episode. You I are do sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. Yeah, slowly turning into compost in front of your eyes. <laughs> Thank you for having me back. Before we get into things, should we hear some words from our sponsor? Why not? As you know, here at Hello, we love all things royal. And our sponsor today has as much love and dedication to the royals as we do. Offering a wide variety of fascinating, high-quality documentaries and analysis, True Royalty TV is an on-demand service that allows you to watch hundreds of regally-themed titles about royalty through the ages and around the world. You can discover more about the Earthshot Prize in True Royalty TV's own bi-weekly royal update programme, The Royal Beat. You've been on that, I have been on that. <laughs> One of their most recent episodes, Royal Tours de Force, tells all about William's most recent trip to New York for the Earthshot Innovation Summit ahead of his journey to Singapore for this year's ceremony, which we're thoroughly looking forward to chatting about today. You can also see how William is following in his father's footsteps in terms of his environmentalism in their documentary Prince William, Monarch in the Making. Luckily for our Right Royal listeners, True Royalty TV are offering a very special offer of a three-month subscription only for the price of one. To receive this amazing deal, all you need to do is visit trueroyalty.tv forward slash hello to sign up today. That is like the perfect offer for you, Andrea. You love a bargain. I do. I love a bargain. (laughs) Thank you so much to True Royalty TV for sponsoring this episode. The platform is available in all major app stores and streaming platforms. Now back to the show. Now, Emily, you followed Prince William's journey since he launched the Earthshot Prize. Tell us about it. Well, it's a hugely ambitious project. It's aiming to find solutions to some of the world's greatest environmental problems. And what's interesting about it is that there's so much doom and gloom about climate change, about the state of the planet. William has taken the approach of being a stubborn optimist. And it's something he's talked about quite a lot. But he is saying, look, guys, we're never going to find answers to this situation if we just bury our heads in the sand and find it overwhelming and, you know, hugely pessimistic because there is a lot of good being done out there. President John F. Kennedy's moonshot speech laid down a challenge to American innovation and ingenuity. We choose to go to the moon, he said, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. It was that moonshot speech that inspired me to launch the Earthshot Prize with the aim of doing the same for climate change as President Kennedy did for the space race. What he's actually doing is bringing amazing projects from all over the world into the spotlight and giving them recognition, first and foremost, but also offering them this chance to win one of five £1 million prizes each year for different categories and have their businesses or their projects scaled and expanded and supported by big business. So it's a way of 
finding these solutions, you know, whether that's to problems like waste or water pollution or air pollution and presenting ways that we can overcome these things. And I've got to say, it's really inspiring to be part of. I don't know if you guys watched either of the last two ceremonies. They were really quite starry events. There were lots of celebrities. I know you're a huge Moira Rose fan, Emmy. Oh, yeah. Moira. She she (laughs) appeared at last year's prize ceremony in Boston. And it's drawn a lot of attention to us. You know, he's got people like Bill Gates. He's got people like Mike Bloomberg, seriously wealthy powerful individuals now backing this cause. Queen Rani of Jordan, for example, is on the Earthshot wow. Prize Council, Kate Blanchett. There are big names associated with this, but what I like about it and what it is doing is giving very small, in some cases, tiny enterprises, this platform to show the good that they're doing and to expand that across whole continents in some cases. So, I think it's exciting. Just to circle back really quickly, uh, are you saying that if I start an environmentally friendly business, William might give me a million pounds? It's not going to be that straightforward, Emmy Burleson. I'm sure he's all ears if you... uh... I must speak to my manager directly. (laughs) (laughs) No, but look, he absolutely has a point. How many of us look at the headlines and panic and think, oh God, we're all doomed, we're all going to be on fire by 2050? Obviously not everyone believes in climate science and whatnot, but I think the vast majority of people look at what's happening around us. We look at the state of litter in the streets, the pollution in our rivers and streams and oceans, and we feel quite powerless to do anything about it. I think the summer that we've had, you know, half Europe being on fire, it's evident. Absolutely. And look, whatever your views on that whole situation are, it's undeniable that There are people who are really making a difference to Mm. people's lives. And whether that's through stoves that use cleaner fuel sources in Africa to ways of recycling waste in India, there are all these incredible projects going on out there. And let's face it, we all could do with some happier, more positive news. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when I think about the environment, I actually, you know, King Charles is the first one that comes to mind because he's been working tirelessly on that for many, many years. Do you think he has really been an influence for Prince William? He was ahead of his time, wasn't he? He was. Look, Charles has been talking about climate change for more than half a century. That's quite hard to get your head around, isn't it? And he would be the first to admit that people poo-pooed his ideas at first. You know, people thought he was crazy, you know, talking to his plants, um, (laughs) which he's openly admitted. He still, to this day, when he plants a tree, gives it a little shake for good luck, which is kind of eccentric. But I think... People have come round to seeing his point of view, you know, what's going on, as you say, around the world is now undeniable. And he has just stuck to his principles on this for such a long time that I think it's really earned him a lot of respect around the world. I was on the state visit to France in September. And what struck me is how much respect the French people had for him, not because he's a monarch now, not because he was the Prince of Wales, but because he is known for having had these environmental principles for a long time. I think that's kind of rare in this day and age to have someone in a position of power who has absolutely been true to their passion projects, if you like. I think it's such a positive trait in Charles that I think has rallied a lot of people to be happy that he's our new monarch, that he feels so passionately about a subject so many other people do. Yeah, and you know, we know obviously the late Queen, she loves her trees. We've heard David Attenborough talking about that extensively. The late Duke of Edinburgh, of course, helped set up the World Wildlife Fund. And so there is this theme running through the royal family's history. What I think William's doing differently is a bit less of the sort of hand-wringing that other environmentalists have done over the years and a bit more positive action. And we've seen from the stories of some of the winners so far, just in two years, how they've expanded and how many lives they are impacting. And it does make you think that if they are given the platform to succeed and the backing to succeed, they really can change the world. So what can we expect from this year's ceremony, Emily? Well, it's going to be really starry. So we know that Hannah Waddingham from Ted Lasso is going to be the host. I love Um, her. We think we're all big fans. And of course, she did so well at the Eurovision Song Contest this year. We have Kate Blanchett, who's one of the Earthshot Prize Council members. Oh my God, really? Yeah. (gasps) And Robert Irwin, son of the late, great zookeeper, I think is the way to term it, and conservationist. Oh yeah, I follow him on TikTok. (laughs) Yeah, so (laughs) there's some big names. You've got bands like Bastille and One Republic playing. There are other film stars from around the world taking part 
And it's really about drawing attention to something that fans might not otherwise engage in. Do we think William has picked these bands because he actually just enjoys the music? Or I mean, that? he may well be a fan. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see if he's like bopping along uh, as they perform. That's some serious star power, though. That's incredible. It is. And I think it shows just how much traction it's getting after three years. You know, they've had a 20% increase in nominations this year. 1,100 nominations from all, wow. all over the world. Wow. And you really can imagine that in 10 years' time, it's going to snowball. Next stop, Gaga. <laughs> oh my God, can you imagine? Well, she Taylor has Swift. worked with him before, you know, as has Taylor. Taylor did karaoke with him. Another example that we found out this week about the effect that this is having on our everyday lives already. I met a guy called Pierre Paslia, who was a winner with Notpla, which is a company that's based here in London. It's producing food packaging from a seaweed-derived source. So it has a kind of film over it to prevent it leaking, but it contains no plastic wow. whatsoever. And he was telling us that, A, it's been fantastic having the exposure that the prize has given him, but also having Prince William directly involved. He's president of the Football Association. So what he's done is introduced Notpla to his beloved Aston Villa football club. You know, we know William's an absolute yes. diehard fan. And Aston Villa have taken this on board and they've looked at their catering and they've decided to switch to non-plastic. It's something that's being trialled at Tottenham Hotspur and Arsenal and other football clubs and other major catering companies who supply all our football and other stadia around the country are getting involved. And so we're in a situation where if you go to a football match at certain clubs at the moment and you buy a hot dog or your chips or whatever, you're going to get it in plastic-free packaging for the first time, which is fantastic. It's small steps like this, but they will grow and grow. And I think he was talking about it replacing five million single use plastics just over the next year or so. Can I let you in on a little secret? Please I do. recently stayed at a Duchy of Cornwall property Ooh. and as I walked in they had a lovely box full of scones and as I opened it I realised it was a Notpla packaging. There we go. So, so he's making all the difference as he well. Is, his, and and yeah. it's just little changes like this which we probably just take for granted but that hopefully will all add up. Yeah, Can you imagine if the ripples just lead to Britain being non-plastic oh, and like, eventually? That could be Massive such a change. huge yes. game changer. Yeah. <laughs> now, I do have a question because the last ceremonies, the finalists weren't physically invited to attend, but this year's is different. Can you explain to us why? Yeah, look, it's a question that a lot of us have asked, given that a lot of carbon is emitted from people flying all over the world. The reason they're all going this year is because they've learned from previous ceremonies that it's actually really beneficial because you have that focus on it. To have the winners there, they can mix with the big name philanthropists, business leaders, investors. There are quite a few events going on in Singapore around the Earthshot ceremony and Having everyone there together is a way for them to all speed up the process. They have the Earthshot Fellowship Week. They're going to be doing some intense mentoring. And what happened this year is that they came and did it in Windsor. So they made a journey anyway. So it makes sense to do it all at one time. And the question is also asked about flying this talent all over the world. Yeah. And what we're being told is that William and Earthshot are never going to tell people not to fly. They're never going to tell people not to get in their car. But this is all about adapting our daily lives to make them greener. They understand that people have questions about that. They are going to be offsetting carbon. But this is about bringing attention to issues and arguably, you know, that is worth the expenditure in terms of air miles. So how will the ceremony work? Essentially, you'll see five finalists presented with prizes in these five categories. It's a million pounds each plus scaling and expertise to support their projects. Wow. The categories are protect and restore nature, clean our air, revive our oceans, build a waste-free world and fix our climate. They sound pretty Intense. ambitious, yes. but these projects can be absolutely tiny. They can be a one-person operation to a whole city, you know, like the city of Milan won a prize last year for waste recycling, food recycling. So the aim is that by 2030, there will be 50 of these projects that have won which have been expanded and are being used and inspiring other projects around the world. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, next up, we're set to be joined by a guest that we know very well and who in turn knows a lot about Earthshot. It is our US editor, Justin Rabbits. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. 
I'm so happy to be here. Well, virtually anyway. Yeah, we wish you were in the room. But yes. actually, I wish that we were in New York City. Yes. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that next time. That would yeah. be a lot better. Yes. Now, Justin, I think it's fair to say I threw you in the deep end somewhat in September when I asked if you could just go along to the Earthshot Innovation Summit with a few days' notice. And I'm really curious to know, what were your first impressions of William? Oh, it was exciting to be thrown in the deep end. It was a heady experience. You know, I've lived in New York or around New York my whole life. I've been reporting on celebrities for like 20 years, and it's a different experience altogether when you're talking about royalties. You know, I was wearing a suit. I was a little nervous, went to the Plaza Hotel, which is quite iconic. And I was pretty impressed with him. I was impressed with him given the scope of the Earthshot Prize and how engaged he really seems to be with that mission. And it was just very exciting and a little almost otherworldly to see him engaging on a global stage with the likes of Michael Bloomberg, Bill Gates. So that was quite heady. So I really felt like he held his own among titans of industry and titans of, frankly, like American history. When you're looking at Bill Gates, like few people have changed the world as much as that guy has. So to see William confident, articulate, charismatic with that caliber of people was pretty cool. Justin, did you have an opinion of Prince William before you saw him in action at Earthshot? And did it change afterwards? Yeah, I remember when we were both young lads and, you know, I just thought of him as Diana's son. And again, working in the industry that I work in, I remember when he was engaged to Kate. I remember covering his wedding, seeing him grow into a man and a husband and a a father. And now he's the second in line. So my opinion of him was definitely he has grown up and he's capable and he's really actually engaged. This isn't him just cutting a ribbon at some supermarket in Cardiff or whatever. Hey. Um, he really, <laughs> he really cared. The cars of Justin. <laughs> we were very oh, see, excited about the new Asda. I just thought of a, yeah, that's where they are right now. Right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Sorry. I'm, not, I'm not mocking that. I'm sure Kate looks fabulous. I love her new bangs. <laughs> no, um, no and, and the thing is, is that here in New York also, I have to say, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but we had insane flooding, really crazy rain. And the city was in a standstill, you know, subways were flooded, people couldn't go anywhere. A couple of people in New York state died. And the reason why I bring this up, it's climate change, it is real. Mm -hmm. And this is part of why the Earthshot Prize is so important. And I don't think Prince William is feeding us a line that he cares about this deeply and he wants to do something about it. So I never thought of him as an unserious person, but seeing him at the Earthshot and experiencing this time that he was here just saw me putting his money where his mouth is. I want to go back to the summit because it's what you say. You know, I think other people that haven't maybe followed William so closely think, oh, he just kind of appears there, does a bit of this and that. But actually, he really is knowledgeable on the subject and he cares about every single detail. And At the Innovation Summit, Justin, the credentials that you got were actually, you know, you could plant them and it would grow wildflowers. Like he had thought of every single detail. Yes. No, I noticed that also, actually. So it definitely was quite thoughtful. And I got to interview a few of the finalists. And the ones that I was most curious to talk to were the ones whose mission was sort of community based. I mean, all of the finalists were quite impressive, but a lot of them were very like techie. But I think because when I think of the royals, I think of them relating and connecting with communities, families, people on the individual level. So one of the folks I spoke to. He was from the Peruvian organization uh, that's all about connecting communities. And I think that what this guy had to say was quite meaningful because he was talking about generations of indigenous peoples in the Peruvian highlands, figuring out how to just make things more sustainable and replace lost growth and stuff like that. And so this is something where you have ancient tribal communities existing in the modern world and trying to adjust to calamity that the modern world has wrought. And then you also have William, who is descended from thousands of years of British kings. So it's sort of like you have ancient roots, people whose roots go way back, completely different families and family trees and traditions and cultures, but they're kind of united in the modern world trying to stave off disaster, frankly. So that was sort of a weird, interesting connection that I made getting to talk to some of the finalists. 
And these are people that you probably would never imagine a couple of weeks ago that you're going to wake up and go and speak to a Peruvian tribesman, right? It's He's able to put a spotlight on people whose stories you otherwise wouldn't hear, which I think is really powerful. Yeah, precisely, precisely. And people have opinions about how useful and relevant royals are in the modern world. And I think Again, William is pretty intelligent and cognizant of that. Again, I don't think this is just an optics reputational thing. But again, this is him kind of proving to me, at least, that he's aware and cognizant and most of all, like, empathetic. And he cares about this stuff because he has kids and he has a country that could be underwater if uh, we don't figure things out. (laughs) Speaking of underwater, and again, he talks about him putting his money where his mouth is. He also... (laughs) was not afraid to get his hands and literally his waders dirty on that trip to New York. I think that was a sight not many of us expected to see, him wading through New York Harbour. And uh, there'd been some heavy rain. And by all accounts, you don't go in the water after heavy rain in New York. Oh, right. Of course. How could I forget? I mentioned our flooding, but the first day of his engagements around town, it was bad weather too. It wasn't quite so calamitous, but it was bad weather. And I was like, oof. Governor's Island in the rain? That doesn't sound so fun. First of all, to those not in the know, Governor's Island is a really cool repurposed island that used to be basically military barracks. And like much of New York, it was revitalized over the past like 15 years. And I go there just often for art exhibits and just to have a picnic. And also it's just on New York Harbor. So it's neat to see William visit a place that I care about a lot. And that's this really interesting historical legacy. But anyway, yeah, I personally would not choose to wait in the East River. I know it's been cleaned up, but I was like, ooh, like, I'm glad I'm glad William's already had children because I don't know what happened after the rain in the East River. Uh, but anyway, the rain cleared up. And he put on waders and he was really game. We spoke with some of those kids that he got to meet. They were really impressed and charmed by him. And by the way, he looks really good in a hat. He should wear a hat more often. Really? <laughs> we'll, we'll pass yeah. that on. We'll You're sounding like yeah. quite the monarchist. Yeah. Yeah. He's joined I know. the fan club. I know. Tell us the I truth. Know. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and I didn't even get any Kate in the picture. If I saw Kate, I would lose my mind. Uh, yeah. And also that other engagement was quite moving when he visited the firehouse downtown right by the 9-11. Mm. And I forgot that. I was like, oh, yes, he was a he was a first responder. So, again, this is not some out of touch royal gesture like he knows what it's about a disaster response being a first responder it was meaningful to me as a new yorker for william to have that emotional connection with these guys with these firefighters downtown and you forget i cannot believe it's over 20 years ago by the way that's, that's, crazy. that's a whole other it's thing. Crazy. yeah it's insane now according to justin william's trip was an incredible success and it's not just justin everyone has said that william's trip to new york was a success. I think there was also a poll not long ago where Americans had him as their sort of number one celebrity figure. Do you buy into that, Justin? What do you think Americans think of William and Earthshot, I guess? Of the royals, I think William and Kate have a pretty good reputation at this point. Not to be too controversial, but I would say, like the rest of the world, there's a more divided opinion of his brother and his sister-in-law. I don't share that opinion. I kind of love all of them, to be honest. William and Kate both have this kind of charisma to them, and it doesn't hurt that their kids are so kind of irrepressible and cute and have (laughs) such personalities. It's just sort of an interesting dynamic that we have this king who's been in waiting for so long, and he's already elder to be honest. So there's something that I'm sure you guys talk about this all the time, but you have this young Gen X or millennial, basically king in waiting and his beautiful wife and their fabulous kids. So I don't know if William is like universally beloved, but I think he's at best really charismatic. Again, I would say not especially if you're American, but Americans really love Diana. Like we loved her so much. So it's like all of this stuff, this debate about William and Harry and Kate and Meg and the grandchildren. Like to me personally, I love Diana so much. So I feel like this weird kinship with William and Harry. There's something there and I don't think I'm that unique. Um, as an American that feels this connection to Diana. How inspired were you personally by Earthshot? I was really inspired. Like I said, I was happy to meet some of the finalists. So I think about climate change when, you know, Queens gets flooded. And I think about climate change in that aspect. And then I'm reminded of 
the other calamities that it has wrought and sort of when you talk about fishing and planting trees and things like that. So I felt pretty hopeful. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. It was really great to hear your insights on that. And I'm sure, like us, you'll be tuning in to see this year's ceremony. 100%. Thank you, guys. Miss you. See you soon. See you soon. Thanks, Justin. Well, I don't know about you, but I love hearing a US perspective on the royal family. I thought that was so interesting. Yeah, we obviously have a lot of listeners in the US as well. And I'm always curious to know... Hi, guys. (laughs) Howdy. I'm always curious to know people's take on things in different countries. There are so many different perspectives on this. And I think that what's so good about Earthshot is it is bringing people together from all over the world. Like You heard some of the people Justin spoke to are from far-flung corners that you'd otherwise never really hear about. And I think that's what it's doing really well. But it's so worthy as well. It's not just a PR move, like Justin was saying. William really does have the credentials to back up everything he's doing. And it's just, yeah, it's really inspiring. I completely agree with Justin. You can tell that Justin has joined every single fan group for Oh, Justin is a monarchist (laughs) through and through. We love it. New Yorker and monarchist. Now, up next is a really good friend of yours, Emily. So who best to introduce her than you? That's right. I'm very excited to welcome my friend, the royal editor of the Sunday Times, Roya Nikar, to the podcast. Welcome, Roya. Welcome. Welcome. Roya, we're thrilled to have you here with us. Thank you so much for coming. It's not our first radio together in an airless basement. <laughs> that is probably a story for another episode. Can we have that story now? Yeah. What? what? Oh, God, <laughs> do you want that story now? <laughs> em and I went to Lesotho with Prince Harry many moons ago and celebrated my birthday there. And our hotel was a very curious hotel. We celebrated your birthday in the basement. Basement restaurant. We had some kind of seafood, which... Had prawns in a very, very landlocked country. Yeah. Uh, Chinese restaurant, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. It It wasn't authentic local cuisine, was it? I wouldn't say it was authentic Lesotho cuisine, but it was as airless as as this room. (laughs) Bringing back happy memories. Happy birthday. (laughs) (laughs) Royal tours. Look, today we're talking about Prince William and his Earthshot Prize, something that has been described as a career-defining project for him. Do you think this is something we will still be talking about in decades to come? I think William would hope that we're still talking about it in decades to come. I mean, it's a very long-term project. It's over 10 years. But I think his hope and ambition would be for it to have a life beyond that. And I think from what we've seen just from the first couple of years, you know, the projects that are being shortlisted and, and the finalists... They're all being scaled up. So I think all of those individuals and organisations probably will have a life beyond the prize itself. So, yes. Do you think we'll look back in the way that we've talked about the now king setting up the Prince's Trust? Is this his equivalent, do you think? I think there are a few projects sort of all together which are his equivalent of the Prince's Trust. I would put Earthshot and the Homelessness Project, which I know we're going to talk about later, and his work on mental health. I would put those three things together as his three core things that I think he would hope will be as much of a legacy for him as Prince of Wales as the Prince's Trust was for the King. How successful do you think Earthshot is, um, could be by 2030? I mean, are we going to be saying that Prince William has saved the world? Or is it more, you know, leading by example? I, do you know what? I don't think that's his ambition. Whenever he talks about his project, particularly with the environment and conservation, it's very much about, yes, finding great new pioneering projects, which Earthshot tries to do, but it's also about tapping into the experts that are also out there in terms of... So I think, I'm not sure he wants it to be about the headline for him saving the world. I think what he would like by 2030 is for the projects to be scaled up. I think he's very keen on sort of measuring the impact. And I think he knows he'll be judged on what those projects are actually doing by 2030 in the same way that his homelessness, he will be judged on the figures in terms of homelessness in a year's time and Mm. five years' time. So I think his ambition would be, as it is with all his work, for it to be sustainable, not necessarily saving the world one man at a time. What (laughs) What makes Earthshot stand out from all his other projects? I think the scale of it, the kind of global reach of it, yeah. the amount of money that's going into it. And if you look at the partnership he's done with Mike Bloomberg, yeah. who was the former mayor of, of New York, his Bloomberg Philanthropies, I think I looked this up the other day because I was writing about it, has put more than £60 million into Earthshot already. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he's hooking up finalists with quite interesting companies. You know, the fact that he's going around the world each year for a final, yes, okay, he's always going to be criticised while you're you're, you're travelling a lot. But I think we're going to Singapore for the next air shop because he wants to get the message out to that part of Asia. The fact that we saw him go to Boston is because the green movement is becoming more prevalent amongst young people in America. So I think 
the global reach is different and the scale of it is different to the other projects that I think he has spearheaded before. We've just seen them welcome Tim Cook, the Apple CEO, as well to Windsor. And he's really having some success, isn't he, bringing in the tech giants in a way that perhaps the royals haven't quite managed in the past? Well, it's interesting you say that because previously he did not have a good experience with the tech giants when he launched his cyberbullying task force, which was chaired by Brent Hobum and the lastminute.com tech giant. He got everyone in. He got Facebook in and Twitter and... He gave them quite a telling off. Well, they they were very happy to keep coming and have tea and biscuits at Kensington Palace, but they weren't keen to even acknowledge there was an issue with young people and safety online let alone do any of the things that the task force was keen for guidelines to sign up to. So perhaps as Prince of Wales, now he's a bit more senior, he may have more luck with people actually doing rather than just coming along and saying. There does seem to be a groundswell of big names coming forward and backing this. Mm. Do you think it's because he has now, as you say, more status as a global statesman? Well, he got some pretty big names on when he launched as Duke of Cambridge. You had the celebrities like Shakira and Kate Blanche on board, and then you had big money coming on board. But I think there's no doubt with someone who's a heartbeat away from being king, it's easier to get people to come to the table and put the money up. And I think he's not shy of maxing out on that. Good for him. A lot of work goes into Earthshot. We were just talking with Justin, our colleague in the US, and he was there in New York when William was there for uh, the summit. There's a lot more work than anyone sees because obviously to get people investing and donating money to this, you know, he's working every day, getting ideas, talking to people. It's not just those days where, oh, he's just going to New York or he's going to the Earthshot Prize in Singapore. It's kind of like an everyday, really hard work from him. Yeah, it is. And sometimes William gets criticised historically for, you know, being work shy. The work shy Will thing that was, you know, back in the day, not so much now. But I think... He doesn't really mind taking that hit because a lot more work does. You know, if you look at the court circular, he's meeting yeah. people every day. He's bringing people to the table. For him, it's not just about going and cutting ribbons, so to speak, which yeah. he's not that keen on. I think for him, the official work is, that is the official yeah. work for him. It is the Earthshot stuff. It is Homewoods. It is the mental health project. So he's very knowledgeable as well. He knows so much because when he speaks... You get that he's speaking because he understands what he's saying and he's read the research and he's done so much work. It's not just kind of like putting his face there and cutting a ribbon. Yeah, and I think you would expect him to because, you know, he's a very high profile public figure and I think none of the royal family have ever been very keen on just turning up and being figureheads for causes. If you look at the work that the sort of senior members of the royal family are doing now from the king down, it's things that they are passionately interested in and have a real knowledge of, whether that's conservation or, you know, the environment or... You know, the Princess Royal going around and opening... Lighthouses. Lighthouse, <laughs> lighthouses, you know, supporting, riding for the disabled. These are things that they're all very interested in and have a proper knowledge and affiliation with. Yeah. So it's I, authentic. It's authentic, yeah. Just to discuss the causes that they're interested in, though. So, you know, we're talking the environment and homelessness and that sort of thing. How do they marry that up with their own lifestyle choices? I mean, do you see them in the future changing their travel habits, for example? It's a very good question, and it's something that we do all pose that question and ask them. I mean, on travel, it's a really tricky one because, you know, the king gets quite a lot of flack as well as William for taking planes and travelling a lot, given that they're sort of campaigning on the green ticket. The king already tries to have his, you know, planes filled with special fuel. Bioethanol or something. Exactly, special fuel that's less polluting than normal plane fuel. I mean, it was what was interesting last year in Boston when we went for the Airshot Prize was that instead of flying all the winners, the finalists, over to Boston, they didn't all fly over. They were very conscious of sort of the footprint, but they are all coming to Singapore. So I don't know what the answer is to that on travel. On the homelessness thing, it's interesting. I mean, I asked William this himself directly recently oh, wow. in an interview and said, look, you know, you've, you're launching a homelessness project. Great ambition to sort of end homelessness at some point, but you have got three big houses of your own and access to any number of palaces and private residences. You can see why people would say this is all very well, but he's conscious of that. They all are. But what would you do? You would say, okay, I've got lots of houses, so I'll do nothing. Or you accept that that's just an issue and you're a member of the royal family and you've got a few houses and you think I can either not highlight this issue because I've got houses or do I think they will all live in one house and never take planes? No. You're so right. It's like it might not change their circumstances, but why is there criticism? Because no, surely it's worse to do nothing. No, I can see why, I can see why to some it seems disingenuous if you're travelling around the world or taking a lot of helicopters. There are always ways they can probably change what they do. 
But you know, I think it's fair enough to sort of question those things. But I suppose it's better to be highlighting issues rather than living your life like that and not highlighting anything. Larry, you followed William's trajectory from university graduate to army officer, search and rescue pilot and air ambulance pilot to Duke of Cambridge and now Prince of Wales. Air apparent. You're one of the very few people who's interviewed him and you're the only person to have interviewed him, I believe, since he became Prince of Wales. How much do you think his real world experience has served him in the position he's in now? A lot. I don't think you can begin to underestimate that. And I think if you look at every life choice he's made in terms of sort of career and direction of travel and the causes he wants to champion, it's so much linked to his life experience. Just something like you mentioned search and rescue helicopter piloting and the air ambulance piloting. William has talked so much about the impact that experiences doing those jobs have had on him in terms of picking up the whole issue of mental health. And he's spoken very openly about that and having to you know, do some very tricky, very distressing rescues in his helicopter, both as an air ambulance pilot and as an RAF pilot. And I think what's really interesting, I remember when I wrote a profile of William, oh gosh, the year before last, what was interesting to me was when he wanted to do the air ambulance pilot job There was real pushback amongst some of the courtiers who questioned whether or not it was right that a member of the royal family should have like a proper day job with a salary, which of course he gave to charity, in the sort of commercial sector. And he had to really push back against that. But I think it's part of what you were talking about, him sort of knowing what he's talking about. Whether that was with the army, him and Harry always felt, if we're going to represent, have affiliations with regiments, we need to be able to look at the soldiers and say, you know, we've done our time too, we know. And it's the same with the mental health. I think having done those two jobs where... He saw the impact on distressed families and also his co-workers. He's lived a bit of it. He understands it. Not to mention, you know, the history with his own childhood, which was difficult, and his mother and her own mental health problems, which she talked about very openly. So I think almost every bit of his life experience is woven into his life choices and his career choices, and now the choices he makes as the next king in terms of the work that he does. Now, we're obviously talking to you ahead of the Earthshot Prize, and you'll actually be accompanying Prince William? I hope to be. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think about the decision of Kate not accompanying? Like, do you think it'll impact the press and the attention that it will get? Because remembering last year is all I can think about is him and Kate turning up, Mm. her in a beautiful green rented dress. Like, we can't say it's a bad idea because we know that she's staying behind to help Mm. their son Mm. with his exams. But do you think it'll have an impact? Probably, Yes, it probably will have an impact in terms of media coverage. Yeah, I'm sure William is aware of that. And to be honest, I think that would be fine with him. Yeah. You know, he went out to New York recently on his own. He was great. She could have gone with him. She didn't. Yeah. He loves having her by his side. And obviously it's very high profile when she goes with him. But I think sometimes he quite likes doing yeah. his own thing. And Earthshot is very much his own thing. And of course she supports it. You know, she yeah, came yeah, to the yeah. inaugural one here. But actually, I think, you know, William would always prefer the focus was on the substance of the projects that he's talking about rather than his wife and what dress she's wearing. Yes, yes, I know. Sorry. No, it's fine. (laughs) It's fine. That's all your fault, by the way. I know. No, no, it's the readers. They love everything Mm. wrong with the... (laughs) Oh, damn. (laughs) You talked earlier about having interviewed Prince William about the Homewards Project, which is another really proactive and ambitious idea that it is going to have measurable results. I mean, that's putting quite a lot of pressure on himself and his team for starters. But why is it important for them to do that and to demonstrate that they're having an impact? We've joked about it already, but what's wrong these days with just unveiling a plaque? It's just not how William rolls. It's not how he wants to do the job. And I can remember him telling someone, I don't ever want to be a ribbon cutter. It's just not what I'm going to do. And a big part of his job is doing that. But... I think he knows he's going to get a lot of flack by putting his head above the parapet on homelessness because A, he's got, you know, three big homes and B, it is a very lofty ambition and he knows he'll be judged on the figures in a year's time and five years' time. But his view is, I'd rather try and I'd rather sort of get all the experts together and really put a lot of energy and money behind this than not. Than do nothing. Than do nothing. And I think he probably feels in the homelessness sector and conservation and the environment, he does enough just turning up to things and unveiling plaques and opening things around that. You know, we saw him just before he launched Homewards. He was unveiling an amazing new project that Centrepoint had spearheaded in Peckham. So 
he does a lot of that too, but I think it's almost like a sort of test for himself. He knows he'll be judged on the results that he's able to deliver with these big projects, and so that's the challenge for him. I think that's what makes him tick. Yeah. It drives him to it be definitely able to see does. change. I think it does. The fact that he's setting these targets and goals, knowing there's a very real chance that he may not achieve them all, is probably what keeps them working even harder and keeps them all motivated. How much discussion do you think there is behind the scenes about which member of the family gets to champion which cause? Because there are some overlaps on there. There are... I think there probably used to be much more than there is now. I mean, certainly when Prince Harry was a working member of the royal family, there was always quite a lot of friction there in terms of issues, military and conservation that he was keen to do because, you know, William was quite keen to do them too. But actually, you've also seen it at play in a very positive way. You know, whenever William talks about conservation or the environment or when the late Queen did or when Charles did, they would all sort of reference each other, mm. you know, and William will often pay tribute to his father and his grandfather for inspiring him. And I remember the Queen giving that address to COP26, saying, you know, I'm so proud of the work my son and his elder son and have done. So I think there probably used to be much more discussion than there is just to sort of try and divvy it up. I think now that there are a few members of the royal family, everyone is sort of in their groove mm-hmm. and everyone's sort of got their thing. And actually, when you think about it, the king has a sort of different way of working now. We know what his legacy projects are. So the profile really is just on William and Kate. Is anyone really sort of looking at the key projects Princess Anne is doing? They should be probably, but they're probably not. Yeah. Well, I think that's like how she likes to roll, isn't she it? She definitely she's, likes to roll like that, yeah. She, get, she Below gets the on radar. with it. Below the radar. Yeah. Five jobs a day, bang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would like to ask what your predictions are, though, for him as the Prince of Wales and to his eventual reign as King William V. What do you think he's going to do next? Oh, <laughs> that's great. King William V sounds weird. No, that's not really weird. That's the first really that's that's time I realised he'd be William V. That's it, will he be, very well, odd. No, but he can choose another name. No, he will be William for sure. Of really? Yeah. I mean, if you, look at, if, you look at, if you look at what was very interesting to me when he launched Earthshot was that he was Duke of Cambridge then, but none of it he was... He called himself Prince William. It was all Prince William. Mm. And that's because, and he's certainly, even now as the Prince of Wales, globally, he's keener to be known as Prince William because... The Americans know and love him as Prince William. Yeah, yeah, you know, they yeah. Love him above all other public figures, according to a recent poll. He'll be King William. I think he'll be a very radical monarch. Wow, really? I, th- I do. I think the monarchy will look very different quite quickly. Oh, wow. When he, I do. I think he will change a lot. I, I think, can't see him doing a lot of the things we've seen. I think he will. Uh, no, I think he has probably got a vision for the monarchy that... A lot of it will still feel familiar, but I think a lot of it will change. Can we no. compare it to any other European royal family? Or no? I don't think he'll go down that route. No, because then he knows the institution is sort of much loved by a lot of people. He knows that a lot of people, obviously, younger people probably aren't that interested. It will still sort of, you know, we'll know we have the British royal family. But, you know, for instance, within days of the coronation, I knew that wasn't really the sort of service he would want. He was very keen to relay that that wasn't the kind of service he would want and his coronation will look very different and very modern. And even within days of his father's coronation, he was putting out there that it's going to be quite different when I'm king. Mm-hmm. So I think things will change quite a lot. Is like more ped back or less religious? Or? I feel like there could be less pageantry, not in a bad way. You might disagree with me on this, but I always feel he looks slightly uncomfortable on Garter Day. Yes. In the ermine and, and the feathered cap. And I think I he does really appreciate the tradition. Yeah. But maybe maybe we'll see a bit less of that. It's interesting. I remember asking one of his sort of good friends about that for that profile piece a couple of years ago, who said he completely understands and appreciates that a lot of people love the magic yeah. and the mystery of it and all that. So he won't strip back all of that. But I think there probably will be a little bit less... Public. Pomp. It uh, might, it might just look a, a little bit more modern. I agree. I agree. Interesting. Relevant. It's quite Relevant. That's his buzzword. Not that I'm in a rush for that to happen. No, Paul well, look, well, you know that... I don't think again, long live the king long for, long our, yes, king. Please. for please. our own mental yeah. health. Yeah. We're also, you know, going to have to get you back in many years' time to check whether your predictions were right. I will have retired myself. Now, <laughs> Roya, thanks so much for coming. It's always a delight to speak to you. And thanks for joining us in the airless basement. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. As you know from Lesotho, I love an airless basement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roya. Pleasure. Thank you. Well, 
that was really interesting. I now have got my head buzzing about different predictions for King William and how that's all going to look. Yes, that was uh, that was quite the prediction. Honestly, so interesting. Can I be in your friendship group with you and Roy yes. now, please? <laughs> are you prepared to spend a lot of time on buses in far from no. corners of yes, the world? Yes, I'll do it. I'll, no. do it for the, I'll do it for the William anecdotes. I'll do it. <laughs> I do follow her on Twitter, actually, and it was very exciting to see her in person. But anyway, let's welcome our next guest. We're so excited to be talking to Vitea Cohen, who is one of the co-founders of Enapta, which won one of the Earthshot Prizes in 2021. Welcome to the podcast, Vitea, and thank you for joining us from Germany today. It's really great to have you here. Well, thank you so much for having us. I'm really excited to be on the show with all of you. Now, you won the Earthshot for Fix Our Climate at the inaugural Earthshot Prize Ceremony. I think it's fair to say that the prize has completely transformed your work. Yeah, I definitely agree with that statement. It has uh, put us on a rocket ship to scale our green hydrogen solution. Amazing. And look, I'll be the first to admit my ignorance when it comes to the science behind all of this. But could you explain to us, as if we were five-year-olds... Because that's the, our mental capacity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ...how Enapter's AEM electrolyzer works... Sure. So as you said, Anapter is a manufacturer of electrolyzers. And so to put it simply, an electrolyzer is a device that uses electricity made from solar or wind electricity to split water, the molecule H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen. So it's very simple. All you need is electricity and water. And there's a reaction that takes place to separate the two gases. And there you go. You have green hydrogen. And we're so excited about it because it's an alternative fuel that can replace fossil fuels. And this clean fuel can be used to power homes and communities, but also can be used as a fuel for mobility and also to meet our industrial needs. Wow, wow. you've made it sound so simple. And yeah, I'm sure it's... And it's still a bit complicated. It's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's incredible to think that this is a solution to so many of our problems. And it sounds like the future. But it's only been in existence, what, for a few years? We have been in existence for a few years, but... Jules Verne actually in 1870 had already said green hydrogen will power our world in the future, but it took a little while for it to really become a mainstream understanding of its potential. And I think the Earthshot Prize did play a role in this to showcase our solution as one worth scaling. And, you know, it actually took until renewables, green electricity became cheaper than fossil fuels as a source of electricity for green hydrogen to become a viable alternative. Can I just ask if this is something you've always wanted to do? How does one get to where you are right now? Came upon <laughs> splitting H2O. I, don't, I mean, I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you ask kids nowadays, what do you want to do? You know, uh, what I want you... to save the planet. Yeah, saving yeah, I... the world is dreaming pretty big. I know, but I mean, it's incredible. I just want to know when you set your sights on that. I definitely was part of those who... We're born loving nature. You know, I love the environment and all of its magic. I was not born thinking, I'm going to scale a solution that splits water into hydrogen. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> but I was born with a lot of curiosity. So when I learned about green hydrogen by stumbling upon it, while having just moved in Chiang Mai after my business studies and read about this solar hydrogen house that was being built, the microgrid was being set up, I had to go meet the people behind this idea and this vision. Sebastian and Jan, who were completing their solar hydrogen house, taught me a lot about it, showed me how it's not that complicated, just as I've explained it to you, that it was possible. And today we are now the three co-founders of Anapter. Amazing. Wow. And now, look, for our listeners to understand, you come from New Caledonia, which is a very, very long way away from where we're sitting in the London studio. Can you tell us how much growing up there has affected your concerns, I suppose, about climate change? Yeah, thanks for asking. You know, New Caledonia is far away. It's next to Australia, New Zealand, and it is like living in paradise oh. you know it's an incredible environment it's white beach sands and an incredible ecosystem underwater also that is living there and swimming there is like 
swimming in an aquarium with, wow. uh, you know, some fluorescent um, corals and multicolor fish. And okay, we'll go and visit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's okay. You can <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're all invited. You're all invited. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I was, I've always had this deep connection for nature and appreciation for our environment. If I think back to my ancestors, they were exploring the seas, following the stars and, and exploring and just fishing, right? And it's quite sad to realize that this same sea is actually threatening their home. And so when I was back in New Caledonia, actually, this summer, I saw these huge rocks on some of the beaches and they were placed there as an effort to preserve the size of the beach to shrink due to the rising sea level. God, so it must be very personal to you then as well. Yeah, 100%. New Caledonia will not be as badly affected as some of the other islands, but my heart goes out to all the islanders who are having to leave their home because of climate change. That's really very, very sad indeed. I would like to know, when did you first hear about Earthshot? And when you heard about it, did you think it was a possibility to win? How did it come about? So we were... In 2020, actually. So imagine yourself in lockdown and you get an email asking you if you might be interested to hop on a call to be considered for the new prize launched by Prince William and the Royal Foundation and that they're launching a prize that is the equivalent to the Nobel Prize for climate Oh solutions. my God. Did you go straight to see the email to see if it was like fake? Because that's what I do sometimes when I get emails. <laughs> go and check the email address. It's Not like, everyone what? is like you. Listen, listen. <laughs> Pandemic just made us all paranoid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, we did go through, you know, a little legit check. Told uh, you. Just to not get our little, you know, <laughs> hopes up. Because, I mean, there are also a lot of prizes out there and initiatives. And, you know, we worked hard to win some other prizes. And so we were considering, okay, is it time for us to start to not spend so much time on prizes? And should we really focus on, on other types of activities? But this one was like a prize that you just don't really say no to. And I think all of us, the whole adapter team is incredibly motivated and driven. So when we entered it, we only thought about winning. Hope to as well. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And then you went ahead and did, which was very, very well deserved by the sounds of things. I wonder, this is a cheeky question, how quickly did you get that prize money? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, well, it's very important because I assume you do take part in so many competitions because you do need the funding to be able to grow. Yeah, I mean, are we talking PayPal, Monzo? <laughs> 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 then yeah, no. I mean, you know, you do raise an important point, right? In order for solutions like ours to have exponential impact to solve our climate, we also need exponential investments yeah. to have that exponential growth, right? So to your question on how is the funding with the Earshot Prize, they take their winners seriously and mm. hold us accountable to yeah, meet yeah. certain goals, right? So it was over time as we met certain milestones. That's amazing. Very good answer I do to like a that. cheeky question. No, but I do yeah. like that, that they keep a tab on and they do care. You well, know, they, I think the idea is that they follow the journey with you, right? Correct. Absolutely. I mean, they've uh, really enabled a lot of our growth up until today. And they also check in just to check, okay, where are you at? What are your next milestones? How can we support? And there's an incredible access to a network that we've definitely been having the chance to engage with. Oh, I love that. Case. So <laughs> how has your engagement grown since winning the Earthshot Prize? We have had the chance to collaborate quite closely with the Bloomberg Philanthropies and overall Bloomberg team. I had the chance to meet Michael Bloomberg in last year and uh, have some of his mentorship and his guidance wow. on uh, building the team and just growing to then also having the chance to have some interviews. But also what's really cool is having access to a lot of the intelligence that the Bloomberg New Energy Finance team puts together. So that's just one of the examples. That's literally things that money cannot buy. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. It's amazing. Think of the whole operation. It's beyond, you know, winning this money. Yeah, that's yeah, obviously yeah. very, very helpful. <laughs> and it does translate right into to results, all of this support, all of this, this whole ecosystem. When you look at the results that winning the Earthshot Prize has brought us is, you know, doubling our sales from 2021 to 2022, growing our team and expanding also our product lines and our impact. And you're all over the world now, aren't you? 
not just you as a team, but also your products? We are. Yeah, actually. So we have more than 3,700 units delivered and working to produce green hydrogen in 50 countries. That's incredible. That's really quite quick work. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's so cool. You know, when you really look into what are these hydrogen producing machines really doing, I'm super happy to just run through a few of our examples. I'll start with the UK since you and your listeners are based in the UK. So just hitting home from the start. We worked with a green hydrogen project developer called Proteum that is helping breweries and distilleries decarbonize and even uses our electrolyzers to fuel hydrogen buses that are running in Wales. And these buses are running emission free. You've won me over immediately. A, A, I'm Welsh, so (laughs) that's wonderful news about the buses. But but also breweries and distilleries. I mean, you know your way to the British people's hearts. Yes. Right there. (laughs) That's some smart thinking. It's these things that we enjoy every day, right? So I think it's really bringing green hydrogen closer closer to all of us and closer to you here in the UK, flying us all across the US and also across into another industry because that is one of the greatest advantages of green hydrogen, right? It's an alternative fuel that can help us replace fossil fuels, not just in the use cases we just mentioned, but also in others like industrial applications, and even to produce an alternative fuel like green ammonia. One of our partners in the U.S. is producing green ammonia that can be used for container ships, for example. It's really quite incredible that, as you say, such a simple process can have such a huge effect. That's incredible. It it does make me wonder, why haven't we done this earlier? Yeah, I think it's been this addiction to fossil fuels purely because of it's cheap. You know, Mm. it's been cheap for a very long time and it's artificially cheap because fossil fuels are subsidized. So when we look at alternatives, the level of playing field is just not there, right? I mean, a clean fuel is competing against an artificially low priced fossil fuel. So it's been only until recently that the world is waking up but too slowly, there's like they're they're hitting snooze, you know, yeah. to the fact that we need to wake up and fight uh, climate change urgently. So, you know, the real reason is just purely because of cost, and we will bring costs down as we scale up solutions like our electrolyzers. It's interesting that you use the word urgently. How urgent is it that this becomes the hopefully norm. worldwide in the norm? Yeah, exactly. Without scaring me, please. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to be scared on this one. I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right, you're right. I think there's been this misconception that climate change is something of the future, but actually it is happening today, right? We've had a summer full of natural disasters, you know, wildfires, floods. 2023 has been recorded the hottest year ever, right? So We've been relying on fossil fuels for too long, and this needs to end so that we can start avoiding decreasing the frequency of these events. And so, you know, for an app to fulfill its mission to make green hydrogen an affordable and accessible fuel for all, we need to scale this solution so that we drive down costs and can fight climate change urgently. Now, I want to ask you, Vite, you were actually on stage with Prince William in New York in September, and you joked with him about excellent teamwork. Um, How does it feel to team up alongside the future king? I mean, it feels awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's an incredible opportunity. And when I reflect on what makes a great team, I see two things. On the one hand, I see skills. And on the other hand, I see values. So when we look at skills, you know, a great team is really about having these complementary skills. So the team at Anapter is bringing a commercially viable and scalable product to fix our climate. And what Prince William does with the whole Earthshot team is to bring visibility, give us access to a network and to people and finance and an overall support, right, for us to fulfill our objectives. Now, when we look at values, I think that's a really important one, right? You would only want to work with people that you agree with and and get along with and have similar values, have similar objectives. And I think both Earthshot and Anapter teams are working with both a lot of urgency, but also optimism. And I think when I look at the climate crisis, I actually see a leadership crisis. Mm. 
too few of our leaders today are taking the responsibility to provide a livable planet for future generations. But when I look at Prince William, on the other hand, he is a leader that is part of this generational shift towards repairing our planet. You're so right, because it's become such a political thing, right, all over the world. But he stands apart from that. So I think he has that ability to convene people, doesn't he, on subjects like this and the influence to actually get people like Mike Bloomberg and Bill Gates in a room, I guess. Definitely. And he is one of the most popular individuals in the United States next to Taylor Swift, right? Really? So, <laughs> this is what we learned from Mike Bloomberg's opening speech, which is great, right? Because I mean, bringing together so many people uh, to agree on this and he is really paving the way and bringing optimism and hope and giving a chance for those solutions, ideas, people to work on their solutions and scale, and also just giving a chance to his own children and future generations. Well, so next up, we just need Taylor Swift to offer a ceremony. And uh, you, know, you know, William and Taylor have danced together on stage. They before, have. Really. So maybe, who maybe knows? at the next ceremony. I mean, <laughs> you who never knows? knows? Um, you never I know. wanted to ask actually, talking about the next ceremony. I know in the past finalists haven't flown over because you know climate change, but I hear that this year they are going to Singapore, and I was wondering if you've been invited. I have been invited. Oh, yes. are you attending? <laughs> I will be attending. We have actually some partners and customers in the region, so it will be also the chance to to visit them and to talk about the growth of their projects. So I get to put together different meetings, including the Shop Prize Week. Next time you see William, just say, us three have asked if he can get Taylor involved as well. Yes. <laughs> Also, if you want to tell him that you had a really nice time on the podcast and if he ever exactly. wants to join, he's more than welcome. So cheeky. <laughs> what was the chance? <laughs> How successful do you think his ambitions could be for Earthshot? I mean, he's given himself quite a tight deadline, hasn't he, of 2030? He has, but I think, you know, it is within this decade of change, right? And we, we can't just wait for things to happen. You know, I think we really need to be ambitious and give it our best. And considering the amount of applications they are receiving now and the work that they do to identify who will be those 15 best ideas, you know, I think that there is a lot of work that goes into evaluating, but then also supporting those finalists to have that great impact. So when we look at the inspiration for the Earthshot Prize, which is Kennedy's moonshot, a few of those innovations that came out of the moonshot are solar panels and x-rays, mm -hmm. right? And these are widely used in today's society. And so if we think about the innovations that can also come out from the Earthshot Prize, then we can hope that we will also have such widely used and scaled solutions to fix our climate, reduce our waste, clean our air, restore our oceans and protect our nature. I'm fully signed up. I think it's so good that someone's doing something positive rather than just all the hand wringing that's been going yeah. on for years and years. Because you're absolutely right. We can't just wait for it to suddenly all go away. It's not going to happen like that. Now, lastly, how optimistic are you that green hydrogen can turn things around in terms of climate change? I mean, I'm fully committed to this, right? <laughs> Of course you are. We are too now, by yeah. the way. <laughs> Good. We're happy to have you on board. <laughs> I'm 110% into this, fully optimistic, being a part of that solution, being a part of the team, working on bringing this solution to the world keeps me optimistic. It's not just the optimism. It's not just the idealism that we have a solution, but it's also having one that is economically viable and that can be scaled. And when we look at why green hydrogen, it's because when we look at our world's energy consumption today, 30% of it is met in the form of electricity. But that means that 70% of our world's energy consumption is in the form of molecules. And this is oftentimes in the form of fuels or gases, which are largely provided by fossil fuels. So there's a clear need for alternatives to fossil fuels. And we have the solution available. You know, it's green hydrogen. And we have a lot of other solutions available to fix our climate, including green hydrogen, right? There's no silver bullet solution. But I do believe that an after has that one solution for green hydrogen and that also tackling climate change is the greatest opportunity our generation has 
and each of us can be a part of it. Actually, yeah, I had a question about that. So what can we individually, like say our listeners right now, what can we do to help with this? I think it's an excellent question because oftentimes people feel like they don't have agency to be a part of the change, but actually we do. We make choices every day as a consumer, right? And so we can choose to act in many different ways. It can be a choice to avoid the consumption of something. It can be a choice to reduce our meat consumption, right? It can be a choice to vote for a certain political party or not, right? There are choices that we make every day that enable us to become a part of change. And even just talking about it, talking about the solution, talking about green hydrogen is being a part of that change. Well, I'm inspired. Okay. I'm inspired. Yes, yeah, same. I've loved our chat. Should we make this an environmental <laughs> podcast? Yeah, I think yeah, we should. I, yeah, I, mean, I, it, it, I yeah. love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Vite, thank you so much. Thank you it's, so thank much. You. It's been, it's been to meet you. It's been an eye-opener for me. Eh? I it, mean, I've loved our chat. It's really, really inspiring. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Well, thank you so much for having us. I'd love to keep you in touch. And we'll have some emission-free gin and beer. Yeah, Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> next time you're in London. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think she might have been the most impressive person I've ever spoken to. What about us? No, no, we've had great <laughs> guests on the podcast, but what a way. I think we're all fangirling by uh, I mean, yeah. She is incredibly young, incredibly talented, and I'm in awe. I'm in awe of her. But, and also, I was just saying this earlier, thank God for people like her who are putting their money where their mouth is and actually changing the world. Listen, yeah. and yeah. thank God for passion projects that Prince William does really work hard on. They're really so inspiring. It does sound like that has been incredibly helpful to their very, very, very worthy cause. And that it's not just, here's your money, it's very interactive. There's a lot of continuity, isn't there, and follow-up. And I think that's one thing that perhaps we didn't discuss earlier, that, that yes, they win a million pounds, but actually, if you, in, in the scale of what they're doing is a drop in the ocean, right? But it's yeah. the mentoring, it's the business intelligence, yeah. it's the support. Yeah. Money can't buy that. And I said it to her. It's just incredible. Yeah. But also to hear how personal it was for her as well, you know, because yeah. imagine your home nation being under threat from rising sea levels. I can't begin to imagine that. No. Well, I feel like I learned a lot from Vitea, and I hope you at home did too. Because if I can understand science, then surely... <laughs> just surely this bit of science. Can. <laughs> Emmy's just heading home now to split the atom. <laughs> Right, so that's everything from us today. Thank you so much to all of our guests and to you two for joining us. We'll be back to talk about royal love stories, so don't forget to subscribe now. In the meantime, catch more from Hello with our news and entertainment show, The Daily Lowdown, available on Spotify, Apple and wherever you get your podcasts. Bye! Bye.